Dr. Liach, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, those who are here and those who are following us on our streaming channel. Yesterday, we had a very interesting day where Argentines are learning. We Argentines are learning a lot from the rest of the world. It's always a good habit to do that. Yesterday, in the morning session, it was very interesting to listen to several foreign central bank governors. It was a day of gradualism. We talked about inflation targets and how to gradually lower inflation rate, which is the central priority for this bank. Now I think we are going to be discussing what we would like to be more of a shock. In a short time, we hope Argentina will become a country when more payments are made electronically. We believe there is a lot of advantage to that. I'm not going to mention those advantages, but by just having a look at newspapers, if you see the number of crimes that are committed with the intention of robbing cash or stealing cash, one of the advantages of electronic money would be to prevent that. And this panel and the next one will deal with the impact of new technologies on the monetary system. Now, in the first part of the panel, we are going to listen to Fernando Álvarez, one of the Argentine economists who are working abroad, one of the most remarkable ones. He has worked on several topics, monetary policy, economic cycle, labor economy. He's the, a professor of the economics department of the University of Chicago. He has been there for over 20, for 20 years, since 1996. He's an associate uh, researcher of the MBI. He's uh, an editor of the Journal of Political Economy. He has been a researcher and professor in universities throughout the world, including Wharton, Ditela, and San Andres in Argentina, Yale, Toulouse. And the most important is that he has been an investigator, at the, a researcher at the Central Bank of Argentina. So this is another star in his resume. He will be the first speaker this morning. And then we will listen to Stefan Ingves. I'm sure I mispronounced his name. He's the governor of the Central Bank of Sweden. He presides the Basel Committee Supervisory Board since uh, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision since June 2011. He appears in the newspapers of Argentina today. And he will tell us, or I hope I will be able to ask him, how has Sweden? Sweden was the first country to issue a bank note, as we know them today, in 1661. There used to be some notes uh, from Italy before, but theirs are the ones that are most similar to the ones we know now. How is that? In, is it that they have become a cashless society now? When, even when they have very beautiful banknotes with Greta Garbo and Ingmar Bergman. So we want, we want to know about that adventure as governor of, of the Central Bank of Sweden. Once again, thank you both for being here. Fernando, now the floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, I wanted to thank the governor, Federico Sturzenegger, the director, Andrew Meyer, and uh, the chief economist for the generosity for inviting me to visit the bank. And also, I don't know uh, if, if it's right to say this, for relaunching the conference. I'm very happy I'm learning a lot, and I hope that what I say will be useful to provide a framework for the rest of the presentations today on technological change and uh, cashless economy. My presentation is in English. In My slides are in English, but I'll speak Spanish. Why is it that policymakers want cash to disappear? Why is it that they think so? Well, there are several reasons. One is that cash is anonymous. And the, its anonymity has a cost for society. You think that 
Privately, you will benefit from that. If you want to have something anonymous, you can make an expense, but you think there is a, an extra cost, for instance, tax evasion, and that has a social cost. There is a private benefit, but no, no benefit to society. So this uh, rate between private and public benefit provides for a reason for anonymity, for a public policy intended to protect anonymity. There is uh, all another value of anonymity is that nobody will control it, that escapes control. There is a trade-off we have to think about. But also, as regards tax revenues and the efficiency in terms of uh, revenue maximizing, using or non using cash in some transactions. You can focus it from the tax point of view in the sense that there are transactions that are done in cash and they end up not paying taxes. And other transactions that are not conducted in cash, so they shouldn't pay a different rate for that reason. Is it fair to have that? We might think it that way. <coughs> We should also think about how much of that relates to revenue maximizing, what we call voracity effect, that is trying to maximize total revenue. I believe it is a discussion that we should have in Argentina, but that will be discussed later by the panel. And another reason that we have discussed, and it is most appropriate, is the, the euro area for Japan is the inability to substantially re decrease nominal interest rates. How does do these policy topics relate to the functions of cash, the classical functions of cash? One is for transactions, transactional function, all of us who have been educated as economists, we should uh, help. I think this is going to help with this. It's good to have a conceptual framework of cash demand, and the choice to have cash or not is how do I pay? If you want to provide a good conceptual framework of that, there are the ideas of Toki Lucas. There are goods that are paid by cash and others by credit. And so we have to think about that. that is related to the means of payment, and we're going to discuss it later. But when you think of cash, cash is one way to pay, but let's think about uh, managing stock. For instance, we know the cash management model by Baumul Tobin. I have money because I'm going to pay something by cash, and I think about my stock. I know that some I will pay by cash, how much I have available, how much I have elsewhere. We should think about both and think about the data sets that we have. We have to think about these ways, these two ways to use cash in transactions. Another traditional function of cash is a store of value that everybody understands in English. I never know whether it's best to mix Spanish and English or to just pick one language. If you think about store of value, why should we think that you cannot have a negative interest rate? Why can't you hold cash? It cannot be very negative because there's always a, there can always be a problem with cash. It can be stolen, I can lose it, and it's cost costly in general. So the store of value, well, that function of cash is related to the policy objective that if I want to have nominal rates, that is the store of value. And you need of account, you may say, it relates to what Guillermo said yesterday. Many prices are in transaction units. So the unit of account, if for some reason prices are fixed or sticky, as we say, that may result in inefficiencies. And this opens the door to the power of monetary policy. 
sometimes you think about that. If you think of the functions of money, we are going to think about these policies to see whether it's good or not, how much beneficial cash can be, and if it may have a social cost. And there are interactions between functions. If I never could use cash for any transaction, why would I keep it? Why would I store it? All of us here are used to thinking of modern models, and in many of the macro models, they don't use cash. They talk about cashless limits, and they are interested in the relationship between the store of value and the unit of account, which are models with ticky prices. I want to bear this in mind, <clears throat> and I want to bear in mind the idea that if you tax the use of cash, <clears throat> how much? Or how far are we going to get rid of these problems? Finally, and I don't think I won't speak much about that, but it would be good to think about it. The logic for the cost of inflation, the traditional cost of inflation, I'm not talking about price distortions. When we use a demand, we say that using money is free of charge while using other things as a cost. The logic that we are using now is the opposite. <clears throat> Those costs, why do we have the Freeman rule? The idea of having much cash is that I will be saving co costs from other transactions which are costly for society. We are changing that. So all of the costs of cash should be higher than the cost I can save in transactions. I want to go back to that. There are interesting papers, such as Matt Wrongly's, who thinks about the zero lower band and the possibility for negative rates and the effect on cash demand. And we can think about it in terms of public policy, but I will talk about other things now. But we should bear this in mind. And if we think about the benefits and costs of eliminating cash completely as a policy. You have to think of a policy. You need to think of social and um, costs and benefits, different from private costs and benefits. <clears throat> we should remember that all those social costs that should more than outweigh the, the consumer welfare in Freeman terms. So it would be, it would be good to measure that and have a good uh, quantitative measure. And let's think about something that Guillermo has mentioned very respectfully. There is the idea that what is going to be the limit and the possibility of commitment to inflation tax if we had a central bank that could control inflation tax arbitrarily? think in countries that have had a 5% inflation tax, which and those central banks could have a 20% inflation tax. OK? Let's think about costs and benefits. Now I am going to discuss with you about something that I wrote on these topics. I like presenting this paper. This one is from mid-2000s when the economist was talking about the end of the cash era. It's lovely because there are dinosaurs and coins in the drawing. Can you see that there are uh, banknotes as well? It's very nice as a motivation. <clears throat> so I want, to, I want us to think about cash as bills and coins as in the drawing. We know it's not disappearing globally. I will show you data for you to see where they come from. What Now, Rogoff has a book about this. If anything, the world economy is becoming more cash intensive. And what I'm going to argument, this is mostly to store value and not transactions. So isn't it a problem for ZLB? First, we are going to be much more impressionistic. See this uh, chart. And uh, here you have data concerning information that we were predicting three basic lines covering 1954 2006 GDP for different countries. And think about 
a world GDP, the full line in black. Therefore, you will see that it's starting in eight, uh, cent, 1954, mid-80s falling, and then upward up until uh, the year 2006. And now, let me share with you a little bit of detail concerning this graph or chart. So, the source for this cash GDP ratio is printed cash printed cash bills in circulation here, there, and everywhere you're going to find data on all those things. I mean GDP on different countries. Uh, there, there are some group countries because there are countries, for instance, using the euro as a currency. So uh, first of all, we didn't have a clear cut idea about the world GDP first, then we started focusing on this data. And uh, here you will see the second part of this chart. First of all, here you have the average ratio cash GDP. And then you have to think about a common currency for all the world at the large. And tell you that some countries were not included on a first stage, and they were included later on. Therefore, it's true that uh, this uh, cash GDP ratio was dropping and falling, and it was difficult to measure it at the very beginning of our research. First of all, cash GDP may be high, as it happens in the USA, because cash is somewhere else, for instance, as it's happening here in Argentina. So what can we do with that? We can count, for instance, bills, or we can count ca cash as a common currency. If we are using something in dollars, then we use it in pesos, and then we have a common currency, and I can have the overall GDP ratio. And there are many other issues. And this is the solution of world cash, world GDP which is the chart I showed you before. In other words, if I think about well cash, well GDP, this is algebra, is cash and GDP converted to a common currency. Of course, we're taking that, uh, world cash, world GDP, average of cash GDP across countries, weighted by country share of world GDP in common currency. Cash in Argentina, for instance, uh, store value is generally denominated in U.S. dollars. Here you have a chart where you're going to find the common currency by group. All countries since 1975 up until the year 2015. Remember that the former chart was up until the year 2008, uh, to be more precise, 2006. So here you have skewed data on currency GDP. Many countries were issuing many cash. There's a sort of distortion here. This is the reason why data is skewed. Here you have different groups, blue one, the world at large, and then the small, uh, medium, and big countries, large countries. Of course, all this information, all this data are weighted by world GDP share. So low-income countries have more cash per GDP. We are uh, mid-sized countries. And then we have countries where we are using dollars and also local currencies. So here you have a GDP by country in national currency on a simple average basis. Maybe we are using cash from other countries. But of course, in this case, uh, it also applies to macro data. In this chart, you can see the world figures in 1975 up until the year 2015. There are many fluctuations due to the rate of exchange, rate of exchange fluctuations, a common one. And the yellow one, the dark yellow one, is the simple average. See the difference between the world, the common currency and the world simple average because there are countries that are more cash intensive and they are of course winning on the world GDP share. So in this uh, case these economies are becoming much more cash intensive. So this is the reason why we are having this ratio common currency and simple average. Therefore, why is cash disappearing? Is it a transactional event or not? Well, we are discussing, is it transactional value? Is it store value? 
This data set that you are currently studying, you are finding all the countries worldwide, and of course, the, uh, whether this uh, country panel is balanced or not, uh, well, it doesn't matter. If we take data, all the graphs and charts are very similar, because before we didn't know about data on uh, Eastern European countries and some other countries. But I do believe that the world GDP is increasing. But if you study the former chart, uh, you see that the same value was dropping up until the year 2000 and 1970. It's a bit of a bummer uh, if we are thinking about cash disappearing all over the world. So here we have two 40-year-old technologies concerning cash holdings around the world in order to, uh, of course, reduce the use of cash credit and charge cards. And then ATMs, of course, which uh, were born in 1960 all over the world in England and, take a guess, Sweden as well. So. When we are in Europe and we see Bancomat, Bancomat is written with a K, all right? And the uh, ATM, the teller machine, reduces the use of cash because, of course, you have a access to cash, you can replenish cash easily, you don't need to have cash in your pocket. This is very much like Tobin's ideas. It affects the choice of payments, especially the, the so-called charge or debit card, as it happened with Stokes and Lucas. I'm choosing another way to make my payments. And this uh, technology has uh, been, of course, spreading all over the world since its birth date in the year 1960 as a store value. Let me share some new, new data on household use of cash for transactions. And I will briefly mention the type of job I do, which is very specific, in fact. I don't know if you are interested in such uh, deep uh, detail concerning my job. But this data on household use of cash, we have comprehensive databases on survey and diary of transactions. So there are surveys on different countries where people are asking you, how much money do you have? When you go to the bank, how much money do you take out from your ATM? When you go to the NTM, which is your bank deposit? Out of your consumption, is it cash? Is it credit card? This gives you an overall idea of cash management all over the world because, of course, all this service about cash management has to do with uh, permanent pulse or the U.S. pulse on uh, the different cash management facilities and ways of using and managing cash. So in many countries, this is recorded in what we call transactional diaries. Uh, data records, number and value of purchases. For instance, you take an idea of what's going on for, uh, say, two or three days a week. You are writing how much money you spend on specific items. You record each transaction by type of goods, of services, how it was paid, uh, the money value of each transaction. And this gives you an idea, for instance, well, I uh, took a taxi and I paid it cash or I, for instance, uh, withdrew money from my ATM. So you can record each transaction that you are making on a weekly or daily basis. And this gives you an overall idea in many countries where uh, you can organize all this data in what we call data panels. Well, uh, this is very small. Table one, household currency management. Here you can, this data uh, pertain to Italy, uh, where you have uh, households with and without ATM cards. See the expenditure segment that is paid with cash. You know that Italy is a cash intensive country, and there you can see those that they don't have an ATM 60% with ATM 50%, and these uh, figures falling in the course of time. And then uh, the household were asked uh, details on cash management. There is an average answer or response for each person, students. Uh, Learning this issue, I 
have learned this issue with Salama, which was who was my professor. I learned that cash or being withdrawn is uh, uh, twice as much as an average. Uh, I learned that uh, many a time people go to a bank and have no cash at all. So if I would have to choose any model, uh, I, of course, have to choose the model I'm showing you right now. Here you have different household silos, information 2004 times 1.5, 400 euros, or even less if they have or have not ATMs. And in Italy, a household normally is made up of three people. Many people are, of course, living alone, and many other people don't have children, etc. On average, three people per household. Another table concerning salient results, you have a lot of countries, rich countries, wealthy countries, so to speak. But if you see the upper part of this chart in the middle, you have payment share by value, cash. There is much heterogeneity in this enormous cash, debit, credit. What happens in Germany? They love cash. And Germany, as well as Austria, have a cash share, payment share value. Value, the value of dollar is very high. Over 50%, 65%, and many a time 53% as well. Australia, Canada, France, and the Netherlands and the USA, this figure is much lower. If you see the upper panel payment share by volume, number of transactions, it is clear that things that are not expensive are bought in cash and things that are much more expensive are a purchase by using a credit or debit card. Here you can have an idea about the way in which you can model all this data on a much more comprehensive basis. Well, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, as you may choose, I conduct my own research in order to share with you structural models, including data. And whenever you have much data on a specific person, the strategy, if you want to guess what that person is doing, think about the Tobin model. You have a parameter, and you can see what a person, an individual, is doing. Of course, it is very easy to estimate what he is doing. It is easy to identify what the individual is doing. So the type of approach toward this structural model is structural indeed, and this is the reason why we call this model structure, as it happened with Tobin, with much more sophisticated models, in order to estimate costs incurred by these individuals. And out of those uh, observations, we can estimate microdata concerning each individual, what they are doing, and we can correlate what we uh, are also trying to find out. And of course, the estimate costs of access into replenish cash, for instance, and some other details. Well, uh, we're working together with Rob because we are conducting our own research concerning the use of detailed Thai village data on cash use. These are rural villages in Thailand with uh, individuals holding a great amount of cash. And uh, we are using detailed Thai village data on cash use. Uh, of course, this is store value, uh, and this is not transaction, of course. And it applies to the former cases in which people were holding a great amount of cash. In Thailand, it's very different from uh, 400 euros in uh, some European countries or, uh, for instance, 80% of uh, the overall cash amount held by Germans. So this type of data sets help you say, find out that transaction is low and store value is high. Uh, by concluding, world or even typical country data is not becoming cashless. And uh, of course, um, people are 
holding much more cash as it happens in Thailand villages or Thai villages. It's very hard, not to say impossible, to account for cash holdings as a role on transaction and real balances in terms of transactions. We do have uh, disaggregated data that is allowing us to interpret them on a comprehensive basis. And we have uh, evidence on transactions concerning technology innovation in cash and management because a great amount of that cash is not transactional cash. So there's evidence of technological innovation in cash management and means of payments that are not really lowering the use of cash in many countries these days. So last but not least, we have to discuss about the progress that we can make in eliminating uh, cash-based transactions. Uh, of course, all this has costs and benefits. But I'd like to share with you, for instance, the fact that there's a low frequency or slow changes that are now happening in the use of cash in transactions. Thank you so much.